Okay, we're talking today with Danny Huber, a Douglas County-based singer-songwriter whose work has been compared to Toe the Wet Sprocket, Early R.E.M., and Crowded House. Danny and his friends are performing in Parker Library's live local music series at 2 p.m. on Saturday, September 24th at the library. Danny is heavily influenced by guitar master Leo Kotke, which is reflected in his unique time signatures and finger picking style. His vocals are reminiscent of Toe the Wet Sprocket singer-songwriter Glenn Phillips, and his fans love Danny's lyrics. You've been a musician since age six when you started playing violin. What drew you, me drew you to music? How does a six-year-old boy happen to pick up the violin? Well, I, I, I'll go with uh, the nature and nurture answer. My parents were both uh, musicians, are still. Uh, my dad played organ and piano, and my mom is a singer, and um, so... Really, I was given two, two choices. One, I could um, learn piano from my dad, or two, I could um, play the violin or pick my own instrument, and I, um, for many reasons, picked uh, the, the violin. Um, just kidding, Dad. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we grew up with. Um, music was everywhere in our house, so very big part of our lives. That's great. Okay, uh, you are most comfortable on 12-string guitar, bass, and vocals. Tell me more, what drove your evolution with guitar and bass and as a singer? Uh, so starting with the violin, um, I wanted to move to a, a more social instrument because it was definitely uh, it was a little uh, lonely in elementary school. <laughs> but So I moved then to uh, the trumpet, which uh, by the time you get to high school is not all that social of an instrument either. It's uh, definitely, uh, I'm sure everybody knows those struggles. Uh, so at the end of high school, I um, switched to guitar and very quickly, it was an acoustic guitar, very quickly then pawned it off and got a 12 string that um, really did make my fingers bleed for a while until I got a, a better guitar. Um, and then just kind of kept moving with that and I still play some violin, a little piano, some uh, trumpet but definitely focus on um, the 12 string and, and sing, singer songwriter stuff. And then with the bass, I picked that up um, kind of on a whim. We were having a jam session with some friends one night and the bass was sitting there. So that's where that spawned. <laughs> and how about as a vocalist? As a vocalist, uh, I, I always sort of sing, you know, that you'd sing with your parents in church or you'd sing when you're in the shower or driving down the street, but um, really what I, I feel like what happened was I wanted to write my own stuff so badly and I didn't want anybody else singing it that I just kept working on it until I felt like I could do it and uh, it you know it's a constant evolution you keep getting um, better and then worse and then better <laughs> but uh, it's something I really enjoy doing good okay um, let's see you ventured into the Denver music scene in 1999 as a solo artist what has changed about the local scene you know, I don't know that a whole lot overall has changed besides the people and the venues, um, the band names, because it's constantly mixing. But it's, I feel like the support in Denver has always been very strong. There's always somebody who's willing to step up and start a new venue or open a warehouse to have shows or, you know, even house parties and just, you know, heck, suburbia is full of... Uh, of little house parties like that all the time where they will bring in their old friends and they'll play. Or, um, so I don't know that it's a whole lot different than when I entered the scene, but I'm less involved than I was, but I'm trying to get back in there. So, Okay. Um, talk about the profound changes in the technology used to produce and access music now. How does that all affect independent artists? I think it affects us greatly. Um, Whereas maybe in the past, independent musicians focused a lot on, on just playing, just being a musician, just being a writer or a performer. Now you really have to step up and become your own producer. You have to mix your own stuff. And, and it's, the tools are there and it makes it easier. But without question, it, it adds a whole new level. Um, and I don't know. Maybe I'm off on that one too. Maybe um, you know people always had four tracks or tape recorders around, and that's how they started things until they could get enough money to go to a, a real studio. But it seems like you know I can countless artists 
even locally that have just sat in their basement and produced some amazing stuff and everything from even really analog based things on four track and just bouncing tracks to uh, to moving through Pro Tools in your basement and don't know how to use it for years, but <laughs> you still eventually get to the <laughs> yeah. spot where you can. So. Okay. Um, let's see. Denver gets a lot of attention regarding its local music scene. Does Denver deserve all the hype? What's the best part of being an artist in Denver in today's market? What's the worst part? Interesting question. I don't, I don't know if I can speak to the best or worst part of it right now. Um, I, I don't know if I have an answer for that one, but I can say that, you know, Denver, I think, has one of the, along with the people who support through venues and other areas, I think Denver has one of the most eclectic mis mixes of, of writers and performers. You know, you've got everything from hip hop and rap that is very, very solid to folk on the other side to everything in the middle and then you've got some you know every once in a while a big band gets picked up and thrown into the charts and um, and that's been happening for you know 30 years plus 40 years plus and and uh, so I don't know I don't know that it's uh, you know it's kind of the same where I don't know that it's changed all that much but Okay, in 2001, you joined the Wind Up Mer Merchants, a power pop outfit that played locally and toured regionally. Tell me about the band and about that time in your life as an artist. Uh, yeah, I was in the, the Wind Up Merchants with um, Josh Shafterly and John Peterson, and, and uh, they had started the band and then were looking for a bass player, and that was another um, part of the evolution I spoke about earlier. Um, decided to go ahead and try out, even though I hadn't uh, officially played bass with anybody but my friends before so uh, it was a big time of growth for me in understanding music because I was definitely uh, I was a lot more folk and uh, I don't know singer-songwriter type music before that and then we mentioned Toad to What's Brockett and Crowded House and um, this was a very different style of music especially for me to start playing and especially to be on bass with it and, and uh, Luckily, I was able to chip in harmony vocals and some of the writing as well. And um, so, more than anything, I would say it was a huge time of growth just for me, um, kind of expanding the world of, of music understanding for me. So. Great. Okay, this is the end of part one. <laughs> it will turn off.